next week, uh, Lord willing, we will be in the sanctuary. We will have uh, plenty of space uh, to do that. That was the plan this evening. Uh, by the way, we are recording these sessions. I know some of you are tied to the choir, um, or you know people in the choir, uh, or people that are just attending other classes and, and want this training of what we're talking about. So these are recorded. Uh, it'll be makeshift tonight, so the camera's right here, but normally we'll use the sanctuary camera and, and all of that stuff, so the quality will be good. Uh, I'm going to give you just a three-minute introduction about why this class is so important and why we're offering it. Uh, you're already here, so I think it resonates with you. But the reality is, is that we are in an ever-increasing anxious culture. Uh, mental health is uh, skyrocketing as far as uh, an important topic to be aware of and an important topic uh, for, uh, for people to address. Our culture uh, tied with technology is speeding up at an excessively rapid rate. Uh, there are incredible new challenges uh, that are around every twist and turn. Um, and we have important questions as Christians uh, to ask the question, well, well, what does God have to say about this? What, uh, does God speak to our mental health? Does God speak to these areas and concern of our life? And how do we address how do we address them? Not only in ourselves, but in uh, in our loved ones. Every one of us in this room has been deeply affected in some form or fashion by depression. Anxiety, uh, severe hurts, and uh, major trials in life. And, and whether it's been you specifically, I guarantee you, every one of us has a loved one, uh, someone in our family. And, and we have the question, well, how do I respond? Okay? And so the aim and the hope for me and our pastoral staff was to offer this class as a first steps and really see what the Lord begins to do in our church. Um, and that is that each of us as Christians to be trained and to have a basic level of understanding on how do I speak to my friends and neighbors uh, and loved ones in my family as they have issues that pop up? Are there things that I can say? Because most often, uh, what, what we're probably guilty of saying is, I really need to point you to a professional, okay? Uh, which certainly there is a place and a time for that, but I want you to be equipped to go uh, those first levels deep about just addressing problems and fears, anxiety, depression, and to be able to do all of that. Now, with that said, it's my getting flags from the back. Uh, so part of our format that we're going to have on a regular uh, fall is going to be, you're going to have some teaching that uh, uh, Dr. Russo and uh, Ms. Elaine, uh, are you a doctor? No. No. All right. But she works hand in hand with him. So this is Dr. I'm going to introduce them to you in just a second. But you're going to have teaching that goes for about 30 minutes. Uh, tonight's going to be introduction, um, and then we're going to—you'll get a layout of what the class is going to be. Um, and then the, the uh, after those first thirty minutes, then we're going to open it up to uh, a little Q and A questions. Uh, we want some dialogue back and forth. Uh, so with that, uh, there's going to be some, there are some white cards that Daniel put right there, and we're going to pass those around. We'll put those on every table. Uh, if you have questions or situations that you have uh, that you want specifically addressed, uh, some of those may be for next time. Some of them for uh, as we're going around with with Q and A once that session, uh, once the teaching finishes. We we really want this to be interactive with you um, as far as making this applicable. Okay, does that kind of make sense? So this this first evening it's going to be introductory. And then uh, me and Daniel and Tim and Elaine are going to uh, just kind of have an open conversation up here. 
uh, that, that dialogues about some of this introductory material. But in the weeks that follow, uh, we're gonna be taking questions from the audience, and if you wanna write some of those down, that's the purpose of that, okay? Now with that, let me introduce, this is Dr. Tim Russo, get up here. Um, I need you to tell a little bit about your credentials, but uh, this is also Rachel's dad, uh, if you don't know that. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been an awesome privilege uh, getting to know you and getting to hear your passion and heartbeat for biblical counseling and to speak to these issues, to train the church and uh, what the Bible teaches and helping uh, you know, the saints to be able to walk through uh, and, and to answer a lot of these counseling situations from the Bible and all of that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim and Elaine. Please introduce your wife to us and talk about her role in, uh, in your... I've never preached in French fries. <laughs> I'm pretty sure his grandson made that mess. <laughs> Uh, so Elaine and I met in high school. It doesn't sound like you're on. Uh, you need to use the mic. You're going to have to use the mic. Yeah. Am I on, Ron? Oh, yeah. You are now. Elaine and I met in high school. She chased me around for a long time. <laughs> uh, it was actually the other way around. And we have been together now, married 43 years, and the Lord, we have grown up together. We basically grew up with our kids, and uh, we work together now, and we just learn so much about life. Life can be hard, right? And we started doing biblical counseling many years ago. And so Lay and I are both certified biblical counselors, and we work with our nonprofit, Relational Impact Ministries, and the Biblical Counseling and Coaching Institute. So Lane wants to say something. Well, I just want to say the girl things. Um, I have four daughters, two son-in-laws, and ten grandchildren, and... That's just a blessing to me in my life. So that's my utmost priority, uh, apart from Tim and the Lord, of course. And I'm just excited that you guys are excited about loving and giving grace to the people around you and to yourselves. So Tim's going to take it away. Okay, due to our time, I will uh, delay telling you more about me and my journey and why I do biblical counseling. I was a pastor for a long time. Uh, we'll do that another time. But let's just jump right into the material. And you'll see from the course overview that we're going to be looking at anxiety, sinful anger, resentment, bitterness, that kind of thing, grief and suffering. We'll take two weeks to cover depression and two weeks to cover trauma. And then we'll talk about identity because at the end of the day, everything boils down to identity. I'll just tell you that ahead of the, the class. And then we'll dive into resolving conflict and what that might look like. So my hope is that uh, our lives will be enriched through this study. Some of the, the things you hear you will be very familiar with and you'll be thinking, well, I, I already know that. Other things, maybe not so much. So my objective is not to teach you what you don't know. My objective actually is to help you apply what you already know. And so what we find in counseling is that the, the greatest challenge is not knowing what to do, but actually doing that very thing. So I want to start with five presuppositions. I may have a sixth I'll throw in there in a minute. Five presuppositions. So this kind of lays the foundation for what soul care would look like within your life and within a local church. So the first presupposition is that we believe... Uh -oh, that God's solution to the problems of sin and brokenness in the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That any other solution presented as a solution is going to be flawed and faulty, and it's probably not going to be uh, permanent in that end. But God intends to use our lives as believers to reflect His character. And sometimes that is done on a mountaintop when we're in having victorious seasons but many times it's done in our own struggles. And of course, we don't like to share our struggles. Uh, we don't want people to see our struggles, but that is really the place that God can shine through our lives uh, in a powerful way. So we believe, you're messing with me, Jason. We believe that uh, religion, secular psychology, 
any, really any other so-called solution to the problem of uh, the human existence and the human dilemma is really not a solution because we believe that Jesus came to earth and provided salvation and redemption for us. The second presupposition is that those who surrender to Christ receive the Holy Spirit. And that means that we, we actually have the very life of God residing in us, in His fullness. And so as we yield to the Holy Spirit, you know this, the Holy Spirit applies the resources, uh, God's resources to our lives. Now, we are not always open to that. Sometimes we're resistant to, to God's will, and thus we struggle at times. The third preposition, uh, presupposition is that we believe that the gospel is sufficient for soul care. It is enough. God has provided within His Word the wisdom that we need to address any problem in life that we encounter. So we believe that the matters of the heart are addressed in Scripture, and we'll be talking a lot more about that. Number four, we believe, as Peter writes in his second letter, that his divine power has granted to us, the church, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us unto his own glory and excellence. So the Holy Spirit brings conviction, brings comfort. He guides us. He provides everything that we need for life and for godliness. Now, we, we probably always know that God has provided the spiritual components for godliness. And then we sometimes put our regular life in a separate category. But this text shows that God has provided for us in every possible way, uh, whether we are aware of that or not. So God's objective in the Christian life is to conform us to the image of Christ. And he uses whatever means he can find and whatever he chooses. Now, I would not choose some of the things he's used in my life. I, I argue and think, well, Lord, there's got to be a better way, an easier way to accomplish this. Why do we have to hurt? Why do we have to encounter these, these challenges and these obstacles? And I think he has good answers to those questions. But soul care deals with these obstacles that we face in life. And again, uh, let me just tell you this. I was a pastor. I was about 30 years old at the time. Began to have flashbacks of being sexually abused. Didn't know what to do with that. Went into a very deep and long depression. Elaine and I found a Christian psychologist who was in our pastor's group. And he met with us twice. Had a medical doctor friend of his who put me on antidepressants and uh, sent me home. He said, you're going to be fine. Well, I wasn't fine. I wasn't fine for a long time. So that experience set me on a search to find out, does, does, the, scriptures, does the scriptures speak to these kinds of struggles? And of course, the answer is yes. The, the fifth and final presupposition is that we believe that sanctification involves a process of repentance that leads to life change. Now, most of the time we think of repentance in a more physical uh, context, like I repent of smoking or I'm going to repent of some other sin. Uh, but when we get into these areas of emotional struggle, repentance is necessary because it, it, it takes us deep into our soul where we think and we challenge our beliefs. And so, for example, as a uh, product of trauma, a person will likely struggle with self-deprecating thoughts, uh, a lot of insecurities, etc. Well, you can't just pray that away. It's going to require a lot of components to help that person walk through that and walk into freedom. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in this class. So let me address the broad approach of uh, soul care by going to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll read a pretty lengthy passage, but you can follow along with me as I read. If, you, if, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above 
not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So here's like a broad piece of priority. Said, as we're living our life as Christians, realize your life doesn't really exist like your neighbor's does. Your life is hid in Christ. You are in Christ. So everything that you experience in life should be seen within the context of your relationship with Christ. And so he goes on to say, therefore, because of your standing and your position in Christ, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. You might want to circle that word, practices, even though we're not going to really talk about that tonight. But circle it. It'll make you feel, feel good. Uh, verse 10, and, and, then, and then have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek nor, and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So we, we have practices attached to our old selves that need to be removed, correct? Did you, did you, hear, did you hear that in that passage? So in verse 12, he goes to the other side and says, Now put on, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you, are, you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankfully, uh, thankful. So obviously we could spend hours on this passage of Scripture, but I want us to see just as a brief overview, Paul presents two basic categories and says there's an old self in you and then now that you're in Christ, there's a new self and that new self has been created in the image of your creator, in the image of Christ. It's the, it's the actual life of Christ in us as believers. So because you have this new life in you now, you have the opportunity and the responsibility to put off those old things that are attached to your old life. So you can imagine we are being renewed. So if we could measure our stuff, which we can't, but if I had a 55-gallon drum of negative, destructive stuff attached to my old self, and I come to Christ, guess what's still with me? That 55-gallon drum. Like, I've got to deal with that at some point. Now, I don't want to deal with it. I want God to take it away. But He's not going to take it away that way. And we find a responsibility being placed at the feet of a believer to deal with these things. And these things show up at times when you don't expect them. There are things in you that you thought were, were gone because you're a Christian, but they show up under certain stimuli, certain circumstances, and that's God's work. Sanctification to me is like you've got this thick book and you, you have a, the first page and the Lord says, hey, we're going to deal with this. And it takes you a long time to deal with it. And you flip that page, you say, wow, I'm doing good. And then there's another full page. And this is going to continue until we, we see Jesus face to face. All right, so we, we see the broad picture. There's a before and after, an old and new. And so as I said earlier, oh, I didn't, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't follow the slides. There's two important points to consider when we're, when we're working on our own uh, hearts and when we're helping people work on theirs as the Holy Spirit leads, that's the what. Like, what do I need to do? And Paul just kind of gave us a, a general, generalized list of what we need to do. Get rid of that. Add this. Let's just go ahead and do that. Well, the problem is when you attempt it, you find that there are obstacles to that, that task. And so we need to know what. 
right? And most believers actually know what. Like a husband knows he ought to love his wife the way Christ loved the church. A, w- a wife knows she ought to respect her husband. Yet when they push each other's buttons, they forget about that. And other things show up. And so these are obstacles to this new life that God has put within us. That life is there. Everything we need is already present in Christ, but these obstacles create problems. So this is where soul care becomes very important in ministry and as we're being discipled and as we're growing in Christ. So I may know that I need to put off anger, but I may not know how to do it. And so this class is intended in a very abbreviated way to address some of those particular issues. Now, the reasons why many times we don't address these obstacles or we we don't know how to overcome them is because we have loyalties. We have loyalties attached to these practices. They have worked for us in some strange way in the past. But in Christ, they don't work anymore. So I may want to go from point A to point B, but if I don't know which obstacles are between those two points and understand those obstacles and know how to get past those obstacles, I'll never reach point B. I can pray about it, but I'm, that's not, that's not going to get me there. This is a fight of faith. It's a fight of dependence on God. And so our old selves are dependent on other things and have been for many years for, for a lot of us. And then we're very good at utilizing those. They, they, they are our default coping mechanisms. And so when we get in Christ and God says, we're going, to do, we're going to do it different. We're going to do a new thing. Well, we're not accustomed to that. That's not what we've learned. We're, we're conditioned to do it the old way. So we struggle with those things. So at its core, soul care is the application of the gospel in critical moments. So when these problems show up, that's a critical moment when the gospel needs to be applied. So soul care certainly addresses the what of the gospel and the what of how we should be living, but it also addresses the how. And so these are five pre- uh, presuppositions. I'm going to throw another one in there that I didn't call a presupposition, and that is we believe that the body of Christ is specifically designed to care for itself. God has put the members of the body of Christ in their specific places, gifted them, empowered them to share those with the body of Christ so that the body of Christ could grow and mature and become more like Christ. So to Jason's point, when we refer people to others who are not privy to this information, who don't understand this process, then we, it's up for question as to whether or not that's beneficial. So let's define soul care. This is a very simple definition, and we could have another five to six definitions to, uh, to complement this. But simply, soul care is caring for individuals by addressing their mental, emotional, and spiritual needs. Soul care is a ministry. It's a way we serve one another. Just as you might serve a family by bringing food or clothing for, to meet their physical needs, soul care is a way of providing for the mental, emotional, and spiritual needs of the body of Christ. Now, Warren Wisby, I like his definition of ministry. He said, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. That is that critical moment of impact where God's resources are present in that moment through loving channels, that's you and me, to the glory of God. So we can't really talk about real soul care or really even growth without talking about the anatomy of the heart and what that is. And I'm going to do my best. I don't know if you've ever thought about how you would define the heart, but to me that's one of the most complicated concepts to wrap my mind around. Because if you've done a study on the heart, you're going to find that there are lots of different words being used for the heart. And we're going to use several of those in this study as well. So we know that God has designed us with an outer person, the body or the material us, and the 
inner person that is the immaterial us, right? So those two, two concepts are real and we live in that every day. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who, cannot, who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Mark 12, 30, he cites Deuteronomy 6 and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God, listen, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. In, in other words, with your entire being. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, Paul writes, So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So the, the soul, the heart, whatever term you want to use for the, the immaterial you and, and I, we live forever, right? We're going to live forever. This body is not going to remain as it is. We know that we have the hope in the resurrection. This body is going to be changed. But it is not changed now. It is a problem now. So whether you are a dichotomist or a trichotomist, at least we can agree that man's makeup is that he has a body, a material person, and a, an immaterial soul or heart or whatever you want to call it. So there's the inner person. So soul care addresses the inner man or the inner person and the matters of the heart. So again, through this class, we're going to be referring to the inner man just as scripture does, terms like soul, spirit, mind, emotions, conscience, all of these terms are speaking about the immaterial us. And so I know that's a very simplistic way to try to understand our anatomy, but this is, uh, we are whole people, even though we're trying in this laboratory to, to separate ourselves, we can't really slice us into pieces and say, okay, this is my this part of me, and this is, we are whole individuals. But I think it can be helpful to understand that we are impacted. Now, what happens in the soul is reflected in the body and vice versa. So here's a verse to look at. This is Proverbs 15. A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but sorrow of heart, by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. So I, if I'm joyful, I have a smile on my face. You can tell. If I'm crushed and sorrowful, you can tell that too. My body reflects my inner man. So Jesus speaks about this, and he, he tells us how problems evolve. And he says this. This is Mark 7, verse 18. Do you not see that what goes into the person from outside cannot defile him? And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the person. Right? So I'm, I'm, we, we could simply add, and when those things come out of the person, they create messes in our lives. And so it's not only that I'm defiled when I give in to these things, these evil things as Jesus describes them, but those evil things that come out of my body or out of my speech create negative things. And so it's a continual cycle of destruction if we give in to our sinful state. So the heart, we could say, is the factory that produces our choices. The choices you make, you might think, in fact, we're not going to be talking about this, but uh, we actually think with our hearts. And, and so, uh, of course, our brain is, 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 it participates. But from a spiritual, biblical perspective, the things we choose come from within us, deep within. We may not even be aware that we're making those choices internally because these things are so ingrained in us. And, and this, this can be very problematic. 
So from a counseling perspective, most problems originate in the heart, as Jesus said. Thus, solutions must be applied at a heart level. So you can't, you can't fix an addiction by putting barriers around a person's life. Now, that could be helpful, but to truly help a person get free from any addiction, uh, it's going to happen in, at a heart level. I didn't hear an amen on that, but that's okay. Uh, so, so Proverbs 4.23 said, Above all else, like above everything, the most important thing, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. Pay attention to your heart. Know what's going on in your heart uh, because that's the most important thing about you. From it flow all of your decisions. And so before coming to Christ, not only do we have a sinful nature, but we have lived out out of that unredeemed soul and established long-term habits. So we are conditioned to live based on things that are anti-Christ and uh, ungodly. And so I think the soul is, is kind of like a lint roller. We go through life and we pick up all kinds of stuff. We don't even realize it. And then when we come to Christ, we've got this big mess. You know, I, I always like to think God can unscramble eggs. Uh, he's the only one who can. We really make a mess of things. And so we are broken and bruised by going through this life. And so if you do uh, a study of the soul in Scripture, you'll find that the soul can be in a variety of conditions. It can, if, it can go from this side of the spectrum, from joy and peace to the other side of oppression and torment. And, and our souls fluctuate, and we can be in one of those conditions either subtly for a moment or immediately, abruptly, uh, and, and be there for a longer period of time. But if we're not paying attention to what's happening within us, then we are just simply reacting. We're living a life out of reaction. And, and so Paul's words to the Colossians kind of speak to us and say, hey, pay attention because there, there's something going on and you need to know how to approach this, right? So Ephesians 2.1 tells us that we were dead in our sins and trespasses until Christ raised us from the dead. Now, regardless of how you look at that, whether we did not have a spirit before we were Christians or we had one but it was dead or dormant, the reality is we did not really come alive spiritually until Christ rose, raised us from the dead, right? So... However, based on Colossians 3 that we read, our spirits are born again, but our souls are not really born again. So we have a born-again spirit who's in perfect communion with God, uh, and then we have a soul that's broken, bruised, and full of all these, these things that, that need to be cleansed and removed from our lives. And so we have to... Uh, see the heart as our primary focus from a personal growth standpoint. And also, as we're working with other people, we have to know that that person really doesn't have the power to change on his or her, her own. You may want to, you may pray to, uh, may talk about it, but when push comes to shove, it's going to require power he or she does not have in and of himself. It needs, the Holy Spirit has to do that work. But he doesn't do the work until we surrender that particular area to him. And we could have areas of our life that are totally surrendered to Christ and other areas that, that are not surrendered. And only the Holy Spirit is in a position to point that out to us. And so when we talk about old and new, uh, you know, before and after, we come to Christ with a an approach to life that is self-reliant, right? So before you knew Jesus, you had to figure out how to have a, hold down a job and have a, a marriage and all these other things. That you, where did you get the ability to do that, right? So you, you depended on your senses, your soul, and you lived out of that. That's what you were dependent on. And you, we, we create what, what could be referred to as a, a, a navigational system where we learn how to navigate life you know, we learn, oh, I'm not going to do that again, you know, and we, we begin to pick and choose how we're going to 
uh, navigate life. And then if we pay close attention to our navigation system, we find that we actually have created a uh, survival system. So our objective now is not to live and thrive, but to survive, to get by. And that's before Christ. So we're very dependent on that. So when we look at the heart, uh, God wired us to worship. We are designed to worship. We are going to worship, period. We're going to worship something. And before we came to Christ, we were worshiping, i.e., bowing down to, trusting in, depending on so many other things to navigate life. And so our hearts are conditioned toward idol worship or worshiping these, these false gods, if you will. So we come and we meet the true living and living God, and now he's saying, listen, I want you to trust me. I say, yeah, amen, I'm going to trust you. Yeah, but I want you to trust me when you feel threatened and your anxiety peaks and you're having a panic attack. I want you to trust me. <laughs> it's like, wait, uh, I'm not sure if I know how to do that. And to be fair, I don't think any of, any of us know how to do that on our own. And so we are in... Uh, process of becoming more and more like Jesus, and that's the Holy Spirit's wor uh, work through the, Holy, uh, through the process of sanctification. And so before coming to Christ, we were all idolaters, whether that's success, fame, approval, comfort, pleasure, and so on, whatever it may be. Those were the things that were the most valuable to us. And when Paul said to the Colossians, your life is dead and it's hidden in Christ. So think about life not as it's like you used to, like it's, it's all about survival and getting uh, ahead, but your life is, is meant for something else now. You have a different purpose because of your identity in Christ. So as we worship idols, and this is just part of how our heart is wired, we actually become more like the thing we worship, right? And this is why... As we behold the glory of God, as in a mirror, uh, Paul talks to the Corinthians about that, we become more and more like Him because we're beholding Him. Well, when we're worshiping our idols, we are more like that and we're connected to that. So the, problem, uh, the problems that we face in overcoming personal struggles have to be viewed through this lens of, of worship and idolatry because that's where the power of the connection is. And we don't have time to really talk about that. But our souls become habituated to these practices and depending on certain skills that have worked. But we are very short-sighted and we have tunnel vision, so we don't see outside of that narrow scope. So if I'm in an argument with Elaine and she has pushed a button in me and I become defensive, I can only focus on me protecting me. I don't, have, I don't have the capacity to think outside of that to say, well, how am I impacting her? And can the neighbors hear? Like, I don't, like I'm in a tunnel because I'm in total survival mode. Does that make sense? And this is, that's just one example. That shows up in many, many areas of our life, especially with these struggles. So let's look at uh, how the heart is transformed. So Paul says this in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and I'm pulling just verse 2 out for this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. There's the action point. Do that. Be transformed uh, by the renewing of your mind. Why? Why do I need to do that? So that you can show, prove, test what God's will is. Good, perfect, and acceptable will. So Paul is laying that responsibility on the believer right? Be transformed. And this is how you do it. Renew your mind. The word renew there is renovate. So if you've ever renovated anything, it's the big picture Paul talked about in Colossians 3. You take out old stuff, you put new stuff in its place. That's what renovation is. So the renewing of the mind is that very concept. So when Paul writes to the Galatians, it's very interesting. I want you to listen to this as though you've never heard it before. Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught, that means overtaken or overcome, in any trespass, you who are spiritual 
should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you, you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So this is soul care, really, kind of captured in these three verses. So several things are worth noting in this. Number one, Paul says mature believers know how to restore this person. The implication is, hey, you guys who are spiritual and mature, I want you to, to help this guy who is, or this girl who is overcome. They, they're stuck. They can't get out. They're cyclical in their sin. You help them. You, you go help them get restored. The implication is Paul thinks these people know how to do this, right? The other thing that, that is worth noting is that restoring the person requires humility and an awareness of the helpers, that's you and me, the helpers' vulnerabilities. So this kind of does away with, I'm up here and the struggler is down here and I'm, I'm going to help you. Paul is saying, no, be careful because you, when you step into this type of ministry, you could be affected to the point where you could become like him or her. So that's not to scare us, that's to keep us real, to keep it real. The next thing that we could point out in this passage is that uh, restoration requires a helper to be spiritual. You who are spiritual, not carnal, uh, this, is not, this doesn't require your, your experience necessarily. It doesn't re require your ability to lead or uh, organize. It, 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 may, it may require some of that at times, but more importantly, it requires us to have the mind of Christ and to be spiritual. Right to be focused, as Paul wrote to the Colossians, on the things of God. Another point is soul care is a form of bearing one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. And lastly, a wrong perspective on helping others can lead to self-deception. And so I was telling someone this week that uh, in our training, we almost always have many, many more women than we do men. And I'm thinking, wow, I look at counseling and this type of work as warfare. I'm like, this is tough work. When you think about what we're talking about here, we're talking about stepping into some very difficult places with people that we would rather avoid. Ministry can be messy. We'd rather do something that's not so messy. The other thing about this kind of ministry is it demands things of us. It calls us to a higher level. It calls us to a place of more maturity. And it's all part of God's design. Another thing is, uh, oh wait, there it is. Soul care is a normal function of the body of Christ. So historically, especially in the last 80 to 100 years, the church has kind of put counseling in a category outside the church. Uh, but I think as we look at, th at the scriptures, we see that that was never God's intent. God, God has always provided for the souls of his people, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual aspects of our life through the gospel. All right, we're almost done because um, I kind of I had it down to 30 minutes. So I don't know. I don't even know what time I started. Um, let's talk about self-confrontation. Self-confrontation. So for us to be good helpers to those who struggle, we have to recognize our role. What is our place in the life of that other person? Why am I, why am I there? How does God want to use me? And so here's what Jesus says. He gives us a word of caution. He says, why do you seek? Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is on your own eye? Now let's just stop there for a moment. A moment. This is a great question. This is a great question. Why can you easily see what that other person is doing, but you can't figure out what you're doing? Now, he doesn't answer that question, actually, but it is a question worth pondering. He goes on, or how can you say to your brother, hey, let me take that speck out of your eye. Let me help you. I, I want to help you. But you, uh, you, there's a log in your own eye. Hypocrite. Then he, listen to this advice. First, 
take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's. So Jesus is not saying, listen, you have a lot of problems in your own life. Who do you think you are trying to help other people? He's not saying that. He's saying, yes, you have a lot of problems. But first, confront your own life. Then you will be in a position to see clearly so that you could actually help that person get the speck out of his eye. So this is wisdom from God, right? So if I desire to help other people in this type of ministry, I first have to confront myself. That's not easy work. We don't like that kind of work, actually. So Jesus basically is suggesting that we are all slow to recognize our own faults. And that it's important that I see a person who is struggling as a mutual struggler. I'm a mutual struggler. And that sort of qualifies me to step into that person's struggle with him or her. Mark chapter 6, verse 34, Jesus said, when, uh, And Jesus, when he came out, he saw the great multitude, was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. So when we are seeking to help others, one of the primary motivations needs to be compassion. So compassion arises out of a heart that understands the difficulty of a struggle. And so one of the complaints about the church I mean, there are a lot of complaints about the church. We're not here to talk about that, right? Not this church, of course. Other churches. Is that a person shows up with a problem and they, they get a, a scripture given to them and basically take this and, and call me tomorrow or something. Like, uh, like, we don't really know how to step into that space with people. And I think God is calling the church back to this. I think it's... It's time for us to re-embrace soul care as the body of Christ. And so as the Lord compels you, you see a need. Uh, we don't presume we can help. We wait. We look. We discern. But the Lord may speak to you and show you, in a, not in an audible voice, but you know what I mean, compel you to step into that. And maybe it's simply to say, hey, can I pray with you about that? Or, I'll be praying for you about that. Call me if you need to talk. That may be the, the simple approach. But we all have personal is issues that create obstacles to our growth. So we're going to end here. And uh, I'm reminded of the late Steve Brown who said, I am just one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. Like that's what ministry is. That's what we're doing is helping people. And I hope that this brief journey that we're on for these 13 weeks will change our lives and, and awaken us to the opportunities to step into people's lives, even the people we know, even the people we see every week who could use your assistance and your support. Let me pray for us before we, we talk about it. Lord, thank you for allowing us to know you and, and to have the wisdom in your word. And Lord, we are all dependent on you we desire to be a part of your work and to extend the kingdom, bringing the gospel to the lost, but also to bring the gospel to brothers and sisters, to ourselves, to, to walk together as we grow and become more and more like you. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we thank Tim? This is going to be good. This is going to be a good 13 weeks. I think two things that we're praying for, right, that that this equips you to step in uh, and, and invest in others uh, that God brings across your path, but also that these principles will be things that you will use in your own life and the struggles that, that we all have. So both of those things, I hope, are things that come out of, out of our time together. Let me remind you again with those note cards, take one of those home, even if you don't have something tonight, stick it in your Bible, stick it with your notes at some point. You may have a, a question that you want us to talk about at some point that we want to be able to cover this. So take it for now. Bring it back when you have something. If you've already filled one out.
can lay it right there on the table as you walk out. Just lay it there. There's a little L-shaped table. There's a brown one. Lay it on the brown table, uh, rectangle as you walk out, okay? Hey, one thing that I want to just talk about for just a second. We got like five minutes here. Um, you said something early on in the presuppositions, number three, um, that the gospel is sufficient. Right? And then it went on to talk about for our mental and our emotional and our spiritual health. This is, when I heard that, here's, um, here's the thing. I leaned over to Jason and I whispered uh, to Pastor Jason. I said, we will say that, but I'm not sure how many of us really believe it. Right? That we, when we really stop to think about the gospel actually answers everything in our lives. Emotional, spiritual mental means that what Christ has done for us on the cross, right? What the work he has done in us is sufficient. So that is something I want to throw out as a challenge is let that sink in and live with that tension. Actually start to test it to say, is the gospel really sufficient? What about in this situation, right? And if you can't see it, that's a great thing to write on a note card. How is the gospel sufficient to deal with this? In, in my life or in somebody's life. But Tim, how, that's a question I want to pose to you for a second and you we can end with this. Okay. How have you um, worked through that to where you, with confidence you can, you can write that down to say, yes, the gospel is sufficient to speak into every area of my life so much so that I can, I can with confidence step into other people's hurts. And, and, and situations with confidence knowing the gospel can provide hope and healing in these areas. Can you just, how you got started on that journey? Because I think that is one of those key things for all of us. Until we feel that confidence, I think we are going to always be looking other places to help deal with some of those, these things that we're going to be talking about. So let's end with that and then we'll be, we'll be done. Uh, and so I'll go to my struggle with anxiety, which I, that goes back to when, before I was a teenager. I mean, always anxiety, panic attacks. Uh, so many obstacles came about in my life because of anxiety. And uh, knowing that the gospel is sufficient doesn't mean that I'm always applying it. And so the knowing is, is very important and very powerful. So even if I am in a conversation with someone who struggles with anxiety, I may or may not disclose mine. If it's beneficial, I will, but I don't assume it is. But if I share that, I will say, I understand that struggle. And I understand how difficult it is. But God is present with you. And the only reason David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid. The only reason I will not be afraid is God is with me. And so in, in real time, in growing to understand both the problem of anxiety and, and it, what it's rooted in and how it develops and how to get free from it, I have to realize that when I am giving in to anxiety, I forget God is present. He's nowhere in my mind. He's not in my conscious mind. And so I have to gradually, it's almost like practice. Get out there and practice and practice of applying the truth of Scripture that God is with you regardless. It may not feel that way because that's, that's a problem with anxiety. Uh, the threat is real in, to the brain. So I don't know if I answered the question, but the, the fact stands the gospel is sufficient whether or not I'm always applying it is a different question. Hopefully I will, but usually I'm not because my old old ways tend to show up. No, that, that's exactly what I, you, you gave an example of the very thing that, that I, was, I was wanting you uh, to just hit on that. There's always, when we get to the root of the things we're dealing with, there is a truth about the gospel that speaks to those things, like with anxiety, a truth about the gospel. God is with me. Right there. So as we, so here, here is a great challenge. As we go through this, one of the things you can be doing is just soaking in the gospel, like thinking about what it means, what Christ has done for me. 
read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 over and over again. It's such a snapshot of the gospel and the work of the gospel in the life of a believer. And let those truths start to sink in because those will be things that I think you'll be able to pull as we start talking about these things. And hey, there is one of those truths about the gospel that applies to anxiety or to one of those things. But that that is one of those keys I hope we all take away is coming away not just with a knowledge but with a but with a confidence in how we can apply the gospel to those everyday situations right? and not just our eternal security, right? I think we all can do that. The gospel, I'm saying, I'm going to heaven. But we miss the fact that the gospel speaks into what we're going to deal with tomorrow, right? So that that's, that's the challenge. That's what I hope we get. Thank you for that. Pastor, anything? Guys? Have a great night. We will either be back in here or in the worship center, depending on the air conditioning, okay? So we'll let you know a recharge next Wednesday. Come back. Oh, handouts. Back at the very back of the room. See the guy waving his hands? We're we'll be back there. If you did not get a packet of notes, we've got more copies at the back table. So get one and find a three-ring binder and put it in there and bring it back next week. Thank you, guys. Have a great night.